Hello, Mount Sinai. Uh, let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again we come to study your word, asking as always that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. We are again studying article number 11, The Perseverance of Saints. Our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. <clears throat> and once again, our main scripture continues to be uh, John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32, which reads, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And our focus continues to be on the latter part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. Uh, one such truth is our second declaration of freedom, which is we have freedom from defeat, no obligation to the flesh. And that is found in Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 5 through 17. And again today, I will read all of the verses, <clears throat> starting with verse 5. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For, it, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. And so we have spent uh, several months now looking at defeat as a mindset. We even drafted Peter and those first disciples to look at the highs and the lows of the flesh that ultimately leads to living in defeat. But then their life changed, things changed, uh, and they went from defeat to victory. One day, they were discouraged and hiding in defeat. The next day, they were declaring his resurrection and walking in joyful victory. So much so that they were willing to die for the truth of the resurrection. If the whole thing was made up, their lives never would have changed. And they most definitely would not have been enabled to lay down their lives as martyrs. They went from living in the flesh and experiencing defeat to being led by the Spirit and experiencing victory. Even the Apostle Paul, who was an enemy of the church, when he saw the risen Christ and that experience transformed his life. So as believers, we can live in victory, 
In fact, we are called to victory. Paul tells us in our verses in the 8th chapter of Romans, based on all that Christ has done for us, we are obligated. In the King James Version, he says that we are debtors. Uh, in, in other words, we owe him. We are debtors to Christ to live according to the Spirit and not live after the flesh. Romans 8 and 12 says, Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. In, in our verses, Paul describes life on three different levels, and, and he's calling us to live on the highest level. The first level, which is the lowest level, is a life without the spirit. Paul contrasts the saved mind and the unsaved or carnal mind. The first contrast is found in verse 5. He, he's contrasting in the flesh versus in the spirit. The carnal mind is the mind of the flesh. The phrase uh, to be carnal minded, carnally minded in verse 6 means the mind of the flesh. If the mind that we are born with, the fleshly mind, it's the mind that we are born with, the fleshly mind that Adam uh, gave us, that he started, and it eventually was handed down to us from our parents. The carnal mind also means that mind that is given over to the flesh. It focuses on the flesh and its worldly ur urges and desires. Uh, to break it down even farther, the carnal mind or the fleshly mind usually goes in one of three directions. Uh, the first is the one that we think of most often when we mention fleshly or carnal minded. It's the mind that is focused on the immoral things, the violence, uh, the material things, the physical things. It's the mind that is consumed with lust and power and money and houses and land and recognition and position and all those type of things. The second direction of the carnal mind may be a focus on the moral and the upright things in society. Uh, th this mind wants to do good things for, for themselves and they want to do good things for the world. They're the do-gooders of the world. They, they could be the upstanding and the well-educated, but they live independently and just as separated from God as the immoral person does. This mind depends on their good works and their great services and their donations to great causes to make them acceptable to God. They think that God will accept them because their lives and efforts have been focused on building a good life and a better society for all. But they fail to see that God is interested in building a, a God-centered society and not a world-centered society. God wants all of their good to be done from a spiritual basis, not from a human basis. Just taking care of the physical needs does not meet the spiritual needs. In fact, when we just take care of the, the physical needs and, and leave out the spiritual needs, it leaves a huge gap in a person's life. The spirit of a person determines how he lives. Either he'll live defeated or he'll live victorious. Either they'll live with God or apart from God. Then finally, the carnal mind may also focus on religious things. A, a person can be a strict religious person and still live separated from God. He, he could be living for religion and not for God. Busy doing a bunch of religious stuff, but not knowing God. Depending upon his commitment to religion, uh, he's depending upon his re uh, commitment to religion to make him acceptable to God. His thoughts are on religious stuff and not on personal a personal relationship with God. The point is that a carnal or fleshy mind does not necessarily mean that a person's thoughts are always immoral. 
A carnal mind means any mind that does not find its basis in God. Any mind that that focuses its thoughts on the physical and material instead of God. The unsaved or the carnal person does not have the spirit of God and lives in the flesh and lives for the flesh. This does not mean that the, the unsaved person uh, never does anything good or that the saved person never does anything bad. It simply means that the bent of their lives is different. One is bent toward God and the other is bent toward the world. The second contrast that Paul makes is death versus life, which is found in verse 6. The unsaved person is physically alive but spiritually dead. The inner man is dead toward God and does not respond to the nudging of the Holy Spirit. He, he may be a good, moral, upstanding, even religious person, but he needs the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The third contrast that Paul makes is war with God versus peace with God, found in verses 6 and 7. In the prior chapters of Romans, Paul speaks about the old nature of being against God and how it will not submit to God's law. The unsaved person is at war with God, while those who have trusted Christ enjoy peace with God. The final contrast is found in verse 8, pleasing Seth versing verse, versus pleasing God. The, that one is pretty much self-explanatory. If I'm pleasing self, then everything is about me. My thoughts are all about me. And rarely do I ever think about pleasing God. The root of sin is selfishness. I will and not thy will. To be unsaved and not have the spirit is the lowest level of life. But you don't have to stay there. Through faith in Christ Jesus, a person can move from unsaved to saved and the second and to the second level of life, which Paul describes in verses 9 through 11 of Romans the 8th chapter. And, and since I've already read the verses, for the sake of time, you will need to go back and read them for yourself. Paul says that if the Spirit of God lives in you, then you are in the spirit and not in the flesh. And the evidence of conversion is the presence of the Holy Spirit within, witnessing to your spirit that you are a child of God. Your body becomes the very temple of the Holy Spirit. God the Father created our bodies. God the Son redeemed them and made them part of his body. And God the Spirit indwells our bodies and makes them the very temple of God. 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verses 19 and 20 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So when the Holy Spirit lives within us, we experience new life. Everything about us takes on a new level of experience. When evangelist D.L. Moody described his conversion experience, he said, I was in a new world. The next morning, the sun shone bright, brighter, the birds sang sweeter, the old elm waved their branches from joy, and all of nature was at peace. Our, that's all elegant, but our grandparents described the conversion experience by simply saying, I looked at my hands and they looked new. I looked at my feet and they did too. It's their hands or, or nor their feet didn't change. How they saw things changed. As great as that second level of experience is, there is a third level of life experience that Paul describes. 
The first two levels are preparation for the third. The third level of life is the spirit has you, which is found in Romans, the eighth chapter, verses 12 through 17. Again, you have to go back and read it. As great as it is for us to have the spirit, it's not enough. The spirit must have you. That is when the Christian experience, for lack of a better word, just simply explodes. That is when we experience the abundant, victorious life that can be ours in Christ. We have no obligation to the flesh because the flesh has only brought us trouble. We do have an obligation to the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit who convicted us, revealed Christ to us, and gave us eternal life when we trusted Christ. Because he is the Spirit of life, he can empower us to obey Christ, and he can enable us to be more like Christ. He is also the spirit of death, which means that he can enable us to put to death or to mortify the sin, the sinful deeds of the body. As we yield the members of our body to the spirit, he puts to death the things of the flesh and he reproduces the things of the spirit. The Holy Spirit is also the spirit of adoption. The word adoption in the New Testament means being placed as an adult son. We come into God's family by birth, but the instant we are born into the family, God adopts us and gives us the position of an adult son. That's important because a baby can't enjoy the privileges. A baby, he can't walk, he can't talk, he can't make decisions. He can't use the family wealth. And, and so we, as, as adults, believers, we can walk and be led of the Spirit. As we willingly yield to the Spirit, He guides us by His Word day by day. Being set free from the bondage of the flesh, we have the liberty of the Spirit and are free to follow Christ. The believer can speak. Babies can't speak. We can cry, Abba, Father. Abba here means Papa. The Spirit says, Abba, Father, to us. And then we say it to God. Galatians 4 and 6 says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. A baby cannot sign checks, but the child of God, by faith, can draw on his spiritual wealth because he is an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. The Spirit teaches us from the Word, and then we receive God's wealth by faith. As we yield our body to the Spirit of faith, there is an amazing work that is taking place. The Spirit of life will empower us to overcome our old nature. The spirit of death will enable us to overcome the flesh. And the spirit of adoption will enrich us and lead us into the will of God. When the Holy Spirit has me and is working in me, there is no reason whatsoever to be defeated. We can be victorious. Why? Because the Spirit of God has me and he's working in me. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen.